I request all of you to kindly contribute your donations to IRF. We required almost uh, 10 lakh rupees, but we are still falling short by 5 lakh 40 thousand rupees. I would be very grateful to you if you people can contribute for us. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa These 10 deeds that can put an end to the Islam of a Muslim is based on this concept of obedience and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first of them is shirk and kufr. The second, ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during supplications, in supplications, in duas, ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third, not considering a mushrik and a kafir as a disbeliever. Fourth, considering someone else other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam to be a better example for you to follow and obey in your life. The fifth, disliking any teaching or any practice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam. The sixth, playfully, in joke or in fun, giving a statement, passing a statement related to Allah, Quran, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the teachings of Islam. The seventh, sorcery, witchcraft, magic of some specific kinds. The eighth, having friendship with non-Muslims, with disbelievers, over the friendship with the believers, with the Muslims. The ninth, considering some people to be exempted from following certain commands of the Sharia, meaning Sharia means the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in Quran and taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Considering some people exempted from following some of the teachings of Islam or the Quran or the Sharia. The tenth, giving preference to learning anything over learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religion of Islam. These are the ten deeds that can put an end to the Islam of anyone who says, I am a Muslim. Allah said in Surah Mumtahina, Allah does not forbid you, does not prevent you, does not stop you from being kind and just with those non-Muslims who do not fight with you for your religion. And they do not drive you out of your homes for your religion. Those non-Muslims who do not fight with you, who do not oppose you for your religion, do not kick you out of your homes and your cities and your towns. With such non-Muslims, Allah does not forbid you to be kind to them, to be just with them. Allah only forbids you. Allah's messenger is teaching us the grade of loving someone. Why am I loving my mother? So as a Muslim, it is important for me to avoid Shirk al muhabba I am loving my mother because Allah asked me to love her. How much am I loving my mother? Am I loving her more than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam? I can't do that. How much? As much as I have been commanded to love her. I have been commanded to love her after Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and deen al Islam, meaning striving for Islam, working for the cause of Islam. Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, Ayat number 24. La takhnatu min rahmatillah. Do not despair the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is Allah teaching us in the Quran? Whatever you must have done, don't despair my mercy. Don't give up to me being the most merciful. The moment you are appointing a partner in the duas to Allah, you are committing a crime of despairing to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are alleging that if I ask Allah, Allah will not listen to me. You are alleging that if I ask Allah, Allah will listen late to me. You are alleging that if they ask Allah something for me, Allah can never reject it. You see, it's a serious issue. So it's a major shirk. So this... Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 
السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ آئی سماک حسین صدیقی ایلڈر سن آف بردر عمران اینڈ اسٹوڈنٹ آف دا آئی آر ای ایف اینڈ اکیڈمیکلی گریجویٹ آف سائیکالوجی شل بی دا ماسٹر آف کنڈکٹ آف دس سیشن بینگ ہیلڈ ایٹ دا آئی آر ای ایف آن ایٹ جنوری ٹو تھاؤزینڈ ٹوینٹی تھری سنڈے ان وی شیل کمنس دس پریولیج گیدرنگ وتھ دا ریسیٹیشن آف دا پورشن آف دا ہولی قرآن وتھ اٹس انگلش ٹرانسلیشن ان شاء اللہ آئی انوائٹ مائی ینگر بردر سنان حسین صدیقی اسٹوڈنٹ آف نائنتھ کلاس اینڈ اسٹوڈنٹ آف دا آئی آر ای ایف ٹو ریسائٹ اے پورشن فرام دا گلوریس قرآن ان عربک ٹو کمنس دس سنڈے سیشن آفٹر ورڈس آئی شیل انوائٹ خاری عبد القیوم اے اسٹوڈنٹ آف دا آئی آر ای ایف ٹو ریسائٹ اینڈ ٹرانسلیٹ دا ریسائٹڈ پورشن ان انگلش السلام علیکم و رحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ آئی سنان حسین صدیقی اسٹوڈنٹ آف آئی آر ای ایف ان شاء اللہ آئی شل نو ریسائٹ سور انفطار اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم اذا السماء فترت واذا الكواكب انتصرت واذا البحار فجرت واذا القبور بوسرت علمت نفس ما قدمت واقرت یا ایوہل انسان ما غرک بربک الكریم الذی خلقک فسواک فادلک فی ای سورت ما شاء رکبک کلا بل تکذبون بالدین و ان علیکم لحافظین کرام کاتبین یا علمون متفالون ان الابرار لفی نعیم و ان الفجار لفی جہیم یسلونہا یوم الدین و ما ہم آنہا بغائبین وَمَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينَ ثُمَّ مَا أَدْرَاكَ مَا يَوْمُ الدِّينَ يَوْمَ لَا تَمْلِكُ نَفْسٌ لِنَفْسٍ شَيْئًا وَالْأَمْرُ يَوْمَ إِذِلْ لِلَّهِ جزاك اللہ خیر وآخر دعوان الحمد للہ رب العالمين السلام علیکم ورحمۃ اللہ وبرکاتہ I, Abdul Qayyum, bin Abdul Hafiz Muhammad. Inshallah, I shall be reciting Surah Taha, Surah No. 20, Ayat No. 124 to Ayat No. 127 with its English translation. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكًا وَنَحْشُرُهُ وَنَحْشُرُهُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ أَعْمَى قَالَ رَبِّ لِمَ حَشَرَتَنِي أَعْمَى وَقَدْ كُنْتُ بَصِيرًا قال كذلك أتتك آياتنا فنسيتها فنسيتها وكذلك اليوم تنسى وكذلك نجزي من أسرف ولم يؤمن بآيات ربه ولعذاب الآخرة أشد وأبقى ترانسليشن In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. And whoever turns away from my remembrance, indeed he will have a depressed, that is difficult life. And we will gather, that is raise him on the day of resurrection 
blind he will say my lord why have you raised me blind while i was once seeing allah will say thus did our signs come to you and you forgot that is disregarded them and thus will you this day be forgotten and thus do we recompense he who transgressed and did not believe in the signs of his lord and the punishment of the hereafter is more severe and more enduring wa akhiru da'wana an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin alhamdulillah all praises be to allah alone i shall introduce briefly the iref to all of you before inviting my father that is brother imran as he is popularly known for mustafa hussein siddiqui to deliver the main talk alhamdulillah the iref islamic research and educational foundation was established in february 1998 as a full time islamic research based educational foundation with my father that is brother imran as the former president of the iref the foremost purpose of the iref is to invite non muslims and muslim alike in the right perspective of quran and sunna in the understanding and methodology of male and female companions of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam subhanallah for the same the iref has conducted several public talks followed by open question and answer session with brother imran as the main speaker of the most of the sessions interfaith and interreligious debates and dialogues with scholars of other religions were also a part of our academic approach to promote the mission of islam brother imran has hitherto traveled to more than 15 countries for islamic talks and also travel extensively within india alhamdulillah brother imran has delivered more than 500 public talks that are now uploaded on the official youtube channel of the iref by subscribing at youtube.com/iref-videos you may also like our official facebook page at facebook.com/irefposts and by adding our official whatsapp number 9989031373 on your mobile kindly text your name and the name of the city of residence on the whatsapp number so that we may add you for updates alhamdulillah my mother nida is a homemaker and is the first wife of brother imran while my co mother that is brother imran's second wife sister amtul mateen in these days conducting exclusive session for women on sunday morning while on sunday afternoon brother imran conducts sessions for both men and women along with my father my younger brothers and i also give brief talks on islam and comparative religion inshallah i now invite brother imran to commence his english talk followed by open question and answer session on the topic those 10 deeds that can end your islam alhamdulillah rabbil alamin والصلاه والسلام على رسوله الكريم وعلى اله واصحابه اجمعين اما بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم افلا يتدبرون القران ام على قلوب اغفالها اما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اي welcome all my dear brothers and the sisters with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh meaning may the peace mercy and blessings of allah subhanahu wa taala be on all of you the subject of the talk advertised for this afternoon is those 10 deeds that can end your islam there are about 10 actions 10 deeds that if any muslim commits then that can end his or her islam i started my talk by reciting an ayat 
from the glorious Quran from Surah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and ayat number 24 of Surah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is an ayat where Allah Rabbul Alameen is asking us to ponder on this glorious Quran. Allah says, Auzu billahi minash shaitan rajeem Afala yatadabbarun al-Quran Do you people not read this Quran with care? Do you not ponder on the Quran? Meaning, do you not try to reflect to the message given to you for your guidance in the Quran? Afala yatadabbarun al-Quran Am ala khulubin or is it that your hearts, akhfaluha, they have been logged, they have been logged for what? To receive the guidance from the message of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We all know this book has been revealed to guide mankind to do deeds and not to do deeds which Allah Rabbul Alameen has commanded in the glorious Quran so that finally we get an entry into the paradise, into Jannat. Now, based on this, the subject that I have chosen, the 10 deeds that can end the Islam of a Muslim man or a Muslim woman is based on the teachings of the glorious Quran and on the teachings of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, wherein you do not find an ayat which chronologically and with numbers puts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 saying that these are the 10 deeds that will end your Islam or a hadith, an authentic hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu which says that this is 1, 2, 3, 4 that these 10 deeds will end your Islam but the Muslim scholars, eminent Muslim scholars based on the teachings given in the Quran and the Sunnat of Muhammad Sallam in the Ahadis of Muhammad Sallam looking at the severity of the teachings looking at the seriousness that Allah Rabbul Alameen has warned in the Quran through his ayat to guide us based on that seriousness and the severity the Muslim scholars they have given to this Ummah at least 10 basic deeds that can end the Islam of the Muslim. Now, what are those 10 deeds that they have derived from the Quran and the teachings of the Ahadis? Before I start on that main subject, let me give you an analogy, an understanding, so that we better understand the subject that I am going to discuss in the course of my lecture. We know that being an Indian, we follow a certain constitution of India and based on the Indian constitution, there are certain do's and there are certain don'ts. So, a good Indian or a bad Indian will be decided based on the do's and the don'ts that the Indian follows from the constitution of India. The same way an American, the same way a Chinese, based on their respective constitutions, the do's and don'ts that they follow based on their respective constitution, they will be decided either to be good citizens of their country or bad citizens of their country. And there may be certain clauses, certain laws that makes a person a non-citizen even if he is born citizen of that place. For example, treachery to the nation, Ghaddari. You may be deprived of your citizenship for conducting certain deeds living in that country as being a born citizen of that country. So the government has the authority to deprive you of your citizenship. Meaning you will be deprived of all the rights, fundamental rights and all the leisures that you may enjoy being the citizen of a certain country. Now, apart from the country, you have different religions on the earth. You have Judaism, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism. So, every religion at certain point of time gives teachings to its people about good followers of the religion and sinners according to the teachings of that religion respective. Meaning, 
if a Christian is following the teachings of the New Testament according to what has been commanded to him, he may be considered a good Christian. But if he is disobeying the teachings of the scripture, he will be called a sinner, an evil Christian, a Christian who is disobedient to the teachings of Christianity. Same will go with Hinduism, one who is following the scripture or the teachings of the scripture of Hinduism, he will be considered a good, good Hindu or a bad Hindu. A person who will be considered a believer in Hinduism or a disbeliever in Hinduism. A person who is a Muslim is of course a disbeliever in Hinduism. A person who is a Muslim is of course a disbeliever in Christianity. So if a Christian is to discuss about any man or woman living on earth who do not follow Christianity, the Christian will call that person as a non-Christian or a disbeliever in Christianity. A Hindu who is discussing about different religions on earth, he will refer to any person who does not follow the teachings of Hindu scriptures and does not believe in the teachings of Hindu scriptures as a disbeliever in Hinduism. So calling somebody a disbeliever of certain religion is neither an abuse nor a mockery to that person but academically or in the literal sense it is to say that these people do not follow what has been taught in certain religion. Similarly based on the teachings of Islam, what Islam has given to mankind is Islam does not believe in the concept of dividing ourselves into geographical boundaries as different countries and nations. Rather, Islam has categorized the human beings either as believers in Islam or disbelievers in Islam. Those who disbelieve in Islam are referred by terminologies like kafir, mushrik, meaning one who associates with Allah or one who disbelieves in Allah or the teachings of the Quran or the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and one who believes is called a Muslim or a Mumin, meaning one who surrendered to the teachings of Islam through the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and one who is very pious, who is very orthodox in following the righteous commands given in the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So these terminologies, believers and disbelievers, mushri, kafir, muslim, momin, these are Arabic terminologies which simply mean either a believer in Islam or a disbeliever in Islam. So based on this, what we need to understand is, Islam from the teachings of Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayat number 1 and Surah Hujurat, Surah number 49, Ayat number 13 made it very clear that in the sight of Allah, all men and women on earth are actually the children of one man and one woman that is Adam al-Islam and Hawa al-Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spread humanity on different parts of the earth giving them different colors, complexions, different tastes of food, different choices on earth in order to examine us and Allah made it very clear in the sight of Allah the most honorable will not be decided based upon where you were born or where you live but your honor in the sight of Allah is decided based upon your obedience to Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa As mentioned in Surah Hujra, Surah number 49, Ayat number 13, what did Allah say? Inna akramakum inda Allahi atkhakum. The last part of the ayat is, verily, the most honored in the sight of Allah is the one who is most pious amongst you, who is most righteous amongst you, meaning who is most obedient to Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the most honored in the sight of Allah. So, the last khutbah, when we read the last sermon at the time of Hajjatul Vida, when Muhammad Sallallahu delivered the sermon, our beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also made it very clear. He said, this day I have crushed all sorts of ignorance under my feet. From this day onwards, no Arab is superior to a non-Arab. No white is superior to a black, no black is superior to a white. No non-Arab is superior to an Arab. No rich is superior to a poor. No poor is superior to a rich. No white is superior. I mean, he made it very clear that the honor remains 
on your obedience to Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is the fundamental core teaching of Islam to categorize human beings based upon how much they are obedient to Allah and how much they are disobedient to Allah subhanahu wa taala. Now based on this, these ten deeds that can put an end to the Islam of a Muslim is based on this concept of obedience and disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now what are those 10 basic deeds? The first of them is shirk and kufr. The second, ascribing partners to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during supplications, in supplications, in duas, ascribing partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third, not considering a mushrik and a kafir as a disbeliever. Fourth, considering someone else other than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to be a better example for you to follow and obey in your life. The fifth, disliking any teaching or any practice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The sixth, playfully, in joke or in fun, giving a statement, passing a statement related to Allah, Quran, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the teachings of Islam. Meaning, playfully or ridiculing, mocking at any of these things related to Allah, Quran, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and Islamic teachings. The seventh, sorcery, witchcraft, magic of some specific kinds. The eighth, having friendship with non-Muslims, with disbelievers, over the friendship with the believers, with the Muslims. Meaning, helping disbelievers against the believers. The ninth, considering some people to be exempted from following certain commands of the Sharia. Meaning, Sharia means the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala given in Quran and taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Considering some people exempted from following some of the teachings of Islam or the Quran or the Sharia. The tenth, giving preference to learning anything over learning the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the religion of Islam. These are the ten deeds that can put an end to the Islam of anyone who says, I am a Muslim. Now, let us briefly understand each one of them. To begin with, as I said, the most dangerous of all the deeds is shirk and kufr. What is the difference between shirk and kufr? Kufr is an Arabic word. The root of kufr is kaf, fa and ra, kafara. Kafara in Arabic basically means to hide something from everyone. A farmer in Arabic is referred as kafir because he hides the seeds under the ground so that nobody can see it. The seed when it is sown under the ground, we know nobody can see the seed after that. So kafir is from that word and it also means the one who rejects something. In the Islamic terminology, who is a kafir? Whoever rejects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the glorious Quran, whoever rejects Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as the messenger of Allah, as the last and final prophet of Allah, or whoever hides from others the teachings of of Islam, whoever hides from others the teachings of Islam, such people who knows that this is the truth, yet they hide it from others and they reject it also, they are kafir. And who is a mushrik? A mushrik is a person who not only rejects all this, not only hides the truth, but instead the mushrik dares to appoint someone as a partner equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divinity. A mushrik, 
he dares to not only reject Allah and his message and his messenger but he appoints partners in the divinity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is a mushrik and a kafir Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made a very clear distinction between Muslim and a kafir in surah kafirun and about the mushrik about shirk Allah rabbul alameen very strongly condemned every form of shirk Allah says in surah nisa surah number 4 ayat number 48 Allah says inna allah la yaghfiru an yushrika bihi verily Allah will not forgive shirk that is association of anything of anybody with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa yaghfiru ma duna zalika li mayasha except shirk for whomever he wills whatever he wills he will forgive any other sin except shirk wa may yushrik billahi whoever committed shirk with Allah then certainly a very tremendous sin they have committed against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you read surah luqman surah number 31 ayat number 13 the last part of the ayat inna shirka la zulmu nazima most certainly shirk is a tremendous zulm a tremendous sin against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so based on this it is very clear Allah made a straight teaching that if you associate anyone with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah will absolutely not forgive you for associating a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any capacity how do we understand it and another ayat surah maida surah number 5 ayat number 72 innahu man yushrik billahi faqad harram allahu alayhi jannah whoever commits shirk with Allah Allah will make jannat haram upon them will forbid paradise will forbid heaven for them wama wa hunnar they will be thrown into hellfire wama lil zalimin min ansar and these zalim these wrongdoers will never find a helper against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help them on day of judgment so shirk has been strongly condemned shirk has been categorized by the ulema as major shirk and minor shirk minor shirk is basically of two types what is a minor shirk the beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i fear the most after me in my ummah that riya riya means to boast in front of somebody by doing something good when you do a good action according to the teaching of islam and you do it with the intention so that the people praise you in order to get some praises from the people appreciation from the people you do it with that intention that is riya in islam and this is considered to be a minor shirk but the punishment can be severe because according to an authentic hadith the beloved prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said vow to that person who comes on day of judgment with great number of deeds piled up like mountains but Allah will blow away all the deeds and say this person committed these deeds to please the other people and he did not do it to please me alone so it's such a severe sin in other words even though it's a minor shirk but Allah can blow away all the good deeds and the other minor shirk is to take an oath in the name of anyone else except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you say I swear by my mother I swear by my father I swear by my wife and children all these are considered to be minor shirk except Allah you shall not take a swearing an oath of anyone else otherwise it's considered to be a minor shirk, shirk by the ulema major shirk has been broadly categorized again as two one under the major shirk you will find worshipping anyone besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considering that deity to be the creator or the sustainer or the cherisher or the one who has the power to destine the universe 
and giving those attributes that are only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or giving names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to his creatures and worshipping them like worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first and major most category of major shirk. Considering anyone equal to Allah and worshipping them or giving them attributes like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or giving Allah rabbul alameen the attributes of human beings. So this is a major shirk. Then under major shirk, the other one is shirkul muhabba wal ita'a. What is shirkul muhabba and what is shirkul ita'a? Shirkul muhabba means to love someone equal to Allah or more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you love anyone equal to Allah or more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is shirkul muhabba and it fits under major shirk. And under shirkul muhabba, you need to understand that if you are loving anyone, it shall be done only because Allah loved them or Allah wanted you to love them. And to dislike or hate somebody because Allah hated them or Allah wanted you to dislike or hate them. This comes under shirkul muhabba. When you read surah Bakra surah number 2 ayat number 165. Allah says in it, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Amongst mankind, there are some who have taken others besides Allah and they love them as though they shall have loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is demarcating, is distinguishing between those people who took others and they loved them, those others, like they should have loved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا But the believers and the Muslims and the Mumin, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who believe, أَشَدُّ You know what is أَشَدُّ? أَشَدُّ is from تَشَدُّد تَشَدُّد You know extremism. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا The believers, أَشَدُّ They are extreme. حُبَّ لِلَّهِ In loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They not merely love Allah, but they are in extremes to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that when any other person comes in your mind, you shall never equate in your thoughts, your love and affection towards that person equal to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who will judge this? Even if there is somebody who cannot judge this, that goes in your heart, the day of judgment, Allah said in Surah Bani Israel, Surah number 17, Ayat number 36, we shall question their thoughts also. So on day of judgment, nothing is hidden from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah can ask, why did you love this person? Did you not love this person more than you love me? So this is shirkul muhabba, if you love anyone, equal to Allah or more than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whomever you love, whomever you love, meaning your mother, your father, your children, your family, including Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whomever you love on earth besides Allah, it shall be because Allah loves them or Allah wanted you to love them. And that too, based on how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you the right to love them. You understand what I am trying to say? Even if you are loving anyone else besides Allah, to avoid shirkal muhabba, you have to make sure I am loving them because Allah loves them or Allah wanted me to love them. And how much to love them? As much as Allah wanted me to love each one of them. For example, the Sahabi asked Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, whom shall I love the most after Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? He said, your mother. After that, the Prophet again said, your mother. After that, the Prophet again said, your mother. Fourth time, the Prophet said, your father. Meaning, now Allah's messenger is teaching us the grade of loving someone. Why am I loving my mother? So as a Muslim, it is important for me to avoid shirk al muhabba I am loving my mother because Allah asked me to love her. How much am I loving my mother? Am I loving her more than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? I can't do that. 
how much as much as i have been commanded to love her i have been commanded to love her after allah and muhammad sallam and deen al islam meaning striving for islam working for the cause of islam surah tauba surah number 9 ayat number 24 hol in kana say to them even if it is your father or your mother ahabba ilaykum min allahi wa rasulihi wa jihadin fi sabilihi if you love them more than allah more than muhammad sallam and more than striving in the way of allah fatar abbasu then the warning is given to us so how much will i love so this is my love for them for my mother my father how much will i love my father my grandfather my grandmother my brothers my sisters my uncles my aunts so a protocol has been decided by muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam through allah or by allah himself directly in the quran where allah made it very clear how much whom you will love and what will be the condition of your love so if i am loving anyone only because of my emotions there are chances of shirk al muhabba meaning my mohabbat should be for allah and whom ever i am loving on earth it should be to please allah or for the sake of allah even even if i am loving muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam why am i loving muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam allah said love muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam so this all comes under shirkul muhabba and hating something because allah commanded me to do so for example the moment we take the name of pig or pork and compared to it take the name of meat or chicken you know our feelings are different now why am i hating pork has the pig done anything to me any time in my life nothing but i'm hating it because allah wanted me to hate it allah disliked it allah made it forbidden for me so unless i do not love or dislike or hate someone based on what allah wanted me to do then it would mean i am committing shirkul muhabba meaning shirk in the love of allah subhanahu wa taala i have not been given the choice to love or hate somebody based on my own understanding by allah subhanahu wa taala so this is shirkul muhabba what is shirkul itaa shirkul itaat is obeying allah subhanahu wa taala to the extent that whoever gives you another command that is in contradiction to the command of allah subhanahu wa taala or makes you disobey allah subhanahu wa taala then in that circumstances we need to understand allah said to muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in surah zumar surah number 39 ayat number 13 allah said qul say to them i have been commanded that if i disobey my lord i fear what do i fear i fear of a punishment of a tremendous day allah is asking muhammad sallam to inform the people that even i being the rasul of allah if i disobey allah i fear of a punishment on that tremendous day so disobeying allah is shirkul itaa allah said that this is what you are to do you don't do it you are committing shirkul itaa and this falls under major shirk now who will decide again either the judge of the muslim state he will ask the question to the person why did you disobey was it because of your laziness or because you thought that i don't care it i don't believe in it if you say i don't believe in it then 100% you are out of the fold of islam you have disbelieved disbelieving in anything any one single thing of islam is enough for you to be discarded entirely from the fold of islam for example in a pure glass of water if i add only one drop of urine to it it is enough to discard the whole water now i have made the whole water impure now similarly discarding any one single ayat of the quran discarding any one single rejecting any one single hadith of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam which is authentic is enough for me to be sent out of the fold of islam so based on this shirkul itaa is a severe sin in islam because allah made it very clear that itaat of allah and muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is fard upon us now apart from this the second is ascribing partners to allah subhanahu wa taala in supplications in duas now the arabic word dua 
is something which is of great importance in Islam. According to a hadith in Tirmizi Sharif, hadith number 3247, Muhammad said, Dua huwal ibadah. The Prophet said, Dua is the actual worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is saying this? Muhammad said, Ad dua huwal ibadah. That is al ibadah of Allah. What? Ad dua. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about dua? In Surah Ghafir, Surah number 40, Ayat number 6060, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Their Lord said to them to make dua to Him. Their Lord said to them to make dua to Him. And I shall answer their duas. I will answer their duas. Ascribing partners to Allah in supplication means taking wasila. The common word used to ascribing a partner in duas to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is taking wasila. The Arabic word wasila, it means to adopt a mean to reach a goal. To reach certain goal, you take certain sources. To adopt any means to reach a goal. For example, I want to go back to my home from my office and I am driving back through the car, by the car. So the car is the wasila for me. That is taking me from my office to my home. Home is my destination, it's my goal, I want to reach there. So the car is my wasila there. Now, when we take wasila of somebody in the duas, there are certain excuses we give. What are the basic excuses given? One of the excuses is, no, no, we are actually calling them so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala immediately accepts the duas. This concept itself is shirk because unless and until you do not believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things and nobody in the universe has the power to force Allah to accept or reject something. Inna Allah ala kulli shayin khadir. Verily, Allah has power over all things. Now, when you say, no, no, we are taking this wasila so that they convince Allah or they will say Allah and Allah will not, they, Allah will listen to them. The way it is projected is as though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obliged to listen to whatever these appointed intercessors are going to say. And the Arabic word wasila has been used in the glorious Quran only two times. It is used in Surah Maida, Surah number 5, Ayat number 35 and Surah Bani Israel, Surah number 17, Ayat number 57. In Surah Bani Israel, Surah number 17, Ayat number 57, Allah Rabbul Alameen says and they say that these people will, will intercede for us before Allah. They have taken these awliya to intercede before Allah. Do they inform Allah of something which Allah doesn't know? Are they informing Allah that these people will intercede to Allah? They have a knowledge of certain thing which Allah himself does not know. How can this be possible? And then Allah says in the ayat, in Surah Bani Israel, Surah number 17, ayat number 57, Allah says that those whom they call upon besides Allah and say that we are calling them so that they intercede for us, the people whom they call, they can neither harm nor benefit them and to whom they call, they themselves are searching the wasila to reach nearest to Allah. Allah is saying, whomever they are calling, so that they take them close to Allah, they can neither harm them nor benefit them. In fact, those whom they are calling, they themselves are searching for wasila to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is wasila? The means to reach a goal. So what is the goal for every Muslim? To reach Jannatul Firdaus, inshallah. The highest place in the Jannat. To reach that place, we say we are taking wasila. The other ayat is Surah Maida, Surah number 5, ayat number 35. Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu takullah. O you who believe, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and take wasila. So you see Allah said, take wasila. They quote this ayat to say, Allah himself said, Tagul Vasilata. Take the Vasila. Now, what is that Vasila? Now, we know this Quran was revealed to Muhammad Rasulullah and if Muhammad 
is interpreting what is vasila there after that there can be nobody in the earth to interpret vasila better than muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and any interpretation for the word vasila contradicting what muhammad sallam interpreted for vasila will always be rejected by a good muslim because what muhammad sallam said is acceptable to allah and anyone who gives any other explanation or practice which muhammad sallam is being contradicted in the explanation will always be rejected by allah subhanahu wa taala so when you read sahih al bukhari hadith number 6502 sahih bukhari hadith number 6502 muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam about that wasila he said it means your nafil salah your nawafil your super numeral salah your super numeral prayers so what is muhammad sallam defining wasila in that ayat your nawafil namaz so now it is very clear from this ayat it cannot be the wasila that i want to take by my choice because muhammad sallam said the wasila in that ayat it means your nawafil namaz your nawafil salah so that is clear the other excuse that is given is you see we only call them so that they take us near to allah subhanahu wa taala the same concept allah subhanahu wa taala mentioned about the kuffar e makka in surah zumar surah number 39 ayat number 3 allah said in surah zumar surah number 39 ayat number 3 when it was said to them to call allah alone making their deen pure only for allah subhanahu wa taala they said we call upon them so that they bring us closer to allah subhanahu wa taala so allah said to muhammad sallam leave them for the time being i will judge in the matters in which they were differing with you so on day of judgment allah said i will judge between them but allah rabbul alamin considered it kufr to appoint any intermediary to call him in the duas in that ayat surah zumar surah number 39 ayat number 3 and when you say you see how can you make somebody listen to you when they are dead so this if we take the name of muhammad sallam in the wasila they forget to realize that muhammad sallam is already dead he is buried in madina and who buried him the sahaba buried him had muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam been alive there cannot be another leader to lead the muslim ummah if he is alive but we know abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala became the khalifa then umar ibn khattab then usman ibn ghani then ali radhiyallahu ta'ala no then hasan radhiyallahu ta'ala no then muawiya radhiyallahu ta'ala no then yazid bin muawiya then we had the abbasid khilafat so all these khalifa they were all the leaders of the muslims only because Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam has passed away and a living prophet cannot be dared buried by anybody but why is this misconception so they quote certain hadith to say you see Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said when you recite durood e sharif upon me salutations when you send salutations and peace upon me angels are appointed who definitely bring your salutations to me so what ever is brought to muhammad sallam muhammad sallam already mentioned about it he never said if you make dua taking my name in between i will ask allah to fulfill your duas he never said that and the concept of believing that muhammad sallam is still alive was ended by abu bakr siddiq immediately after the death of muhammad sallam we all know that when muhammad sallam passed away umar ibn khattab radhiyallahu ta'ala no when he was told that muhammad sallam has died he reacted umar ibn khattab reacted and he said if anyone is going to say that muhammad sallam died i will slay him so the people reached abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala to inform that umar ibn khattab radhiyallahu ta'ala no is not agreeing to believe that muhammad sallam is dead so abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala is still this was a time when muhammad sallam was still not buried in his grave he was still not buried and this incident happened immediately abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala no gathered all the sahaba in masjid e nabawi including umar ibn khattab radhiyallahu ta'ala no who was in the midst of those sahaba gathered in masjid e nabawi abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala no started giving a sermon he recited surah ali imran surah number 3 ayat number 144 where allah said muhammad sallam is the messenger of allah if he is killed or if he dies are you going to turn away from your deen and if anybody does that can do no harm to allah subhanahu wa taala then after reciting this ayat abu bakr siddiq radhiyallahu ta'ala no gave a very historic sermon 
He said, remember, those people who used to worship Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let them know that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a messenger of Allah and he has died. Those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let them know Allah alone is living always. Allah alone is ever living. Death will never come to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. When you read Sayyid Bukhari, Hadith number 3667, 3668, this khutbah of Abu Bakr Siddiq is recorded there. And Umar ibn Khattab, ta'ala, no, he immediately gives up and he says, when Abu Bakr Siddiq ta'ala, recited Ali Imran Surah number 3, Ayat number 144, I felt for the first time that this was the first time when the Ayat was revealed. What does it mean? Abu Bakr Siddiq, ta'ala, no, subhanallah, the very first misconception to be cleared about belief in Islam was by Abu Bakr Siddiq making the Sahaba believe that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is dead. And when you read Sahih al-Bukhari, Hadith number 1010, 1010, 1010, there is an incident that during the Caliphate of Umar ibn Khattab, anhu, there was a famine in Medina. It was not raining in Medina. And the Sahaba came to Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala to say, Ya Amirul Mu'minin, you are the leader of the Muslims. We find you to be the best after Abu Bakr Siddiq ta'ala anhu. Please pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that it rains. Where did this happen? In Medina. And Umar ibn Khattab ta'ala responded and he said, I find the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, to be a better Muslim than me. Let us all go to him and request him to pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for rain. So all of them, they went to Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu prayed and then it rained. Now what is important for us to understand from hadith number 1010 of Sayyid al-Bukhari, Umar ibn Khattab, all the sahaba including Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu who is from Ahle Bayt and he is in Medina. Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu is the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu he is the uncle of Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He is the father of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And those people who came to request Umar ibn Khattab to make dua, Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu was also there. Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was also there. There was Hassan and Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu. All of them were there. When they came to Umar ibn Khattab, why did he not go to the grave of Muhammad sallallahu to make that dua? In making Muhammad sallallahu as an intercessor to Allah subhanahu ta'ala. He didn't do that because all the Sahaba knew this is not the correct way of making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What they did is they went to the one whom they found to be the best amongst them in practicing Islam that is Abbas radiallahu ta'ala. They also give an example from Surah Tawbah Surah number 9 ayat number 103 and Surah Nisa Surah number 4 ayat number 64 where Allah said that when Muhammad Sallam was living, Allah said, had these hypocrites come to you and asked you to pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for their forgiveness, O Muhammad Sallam, and had you prayed for them, Allah would have accepted your prayers and forgave them. Surah Nisa, ayat number 64. Surah Taba, Surah number 9, ayat number 103. And O Muhammad Sallam, if they come to you to pay the zakat, take the zakat from them and pray for them. So they say, you see, Allah said, go to Muhammad Islam and ask him to pray for you. Agreed. But Umar ibn Khattab, Abbas radiallahu ta'ala, all the sahaba, they understand these two ayat better than any other Muslim on the face of the earth till Qiyamah. There were huffas of Quran. Yet, at the time when there was famine in Medina, hadith number 1010 of Bukhari, they did not go to the grave of Muhammad Islam. What they understood is, these ayat of the Quran from Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, ayat number 64 and Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, ayat number 103, they were only when Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi was living between them, not after he died. Then they quote about appointing other dead pious Muslim people as the intercessors, ascribing partners to Allah in their duas, with the reference from Surah Bakra mainly, Surah Bakra, Surah number 2, ayat number 154, and Surah Ali Imran, Surah number 3, they say, Allah said in those ayat, 
whoever dies in the way of Allah, do not call them dead. They are alive. But you do not know. You see, Allah is saying they are alive. Who is alive? When you read the ayat, the ayat do not say, Wala takhulu limai amwat fi sabilillah. Amwat is from moth. Do not call those who are dead in the way. The ayat says, Wala takhulu limai yukhtalu fi sabilillah. Do not call them dead who were killed in the way of Allah. Not who died in the way of Allah. There is a huge difference of chalk and cheese between those who died in the way of Allah and those who were killed in the way of Allah. The ayat is about martyrs. And again, when Allah said, do not call them dead, Allah also mentioned in the same ayat at the end, you do not know how they are alive. When Allah is saying, you do not know how they are alive, I am saying they are alive and they can listen to me. And again, who is the best to explain those ayat to us? None other than Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself. So the beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam directly gave the explanation, the tafsir of these ayat also. When you read Ali Imran surah number three, ayat number one hundred and sixty-nine. When you read the tafsir of this ayat, hadith number two thousand eight hundred and one of Ibn Majah, Yazid Ibn Majah. When you read the tafsir of Ali Imran ayat number 169, Muhammad Sassam said, Whenever any Muslim is killed in the way of Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes his soul enter into green bird. And the bird is let free in the jannat, in the paradise. And the bird keeps flying till it comes back and it rests under the lanterns or the lamps which are hanging under the arsh of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When the bird sits there to take rest, Allah inquires from the bird. Meaning from the bird means from the soul of the martyr. What does Allah ask? Allah says, do you want anything else? The Prophet sallallahu said, the soul of the martyr, it replies. It says, no, O Allah, what else can I ask you here? After a while, again Allah questions the same thing. Again the answer is, no Allah, what else can I ask you for? Third time when Allah asks, the soul of the martyr, it says, Ya Allah, restore my soul in my dead body and let me go back in this world so that I fight and I once again die for you and let the people know the reward for the people who die in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says, had you asked anything besides this, I would have granted for my sunnah is to resurrect all of you only on day of judgment. Now, Bal Ahayaun, the ayat, Surah Bakra, ayat number 154, and Al Imran, ayat number 169, they are living. How are they living? This is how they are living. Where did Muhammad Sassam say they can listen to you? So they could. No, when you go on any graves, Muhammad Sassam said, say, Assalamu alaikum, ahlud dayar, minal mumini, nawal muminat, and there are other salams also. But the Quran is saying in Surah Namal, Surah number 30, 27, ayat number 80, and Surah Fatir Surah number 35 Ayat number 21 to 24 That O oh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam You cannot make those people listen Who are dead in their graves Except those whom Allah wills Meaning whom Allah wills Except those Whatever Allah wills He will make them listen to you And whomever Allah wills Only they will listen to you It does not give a generic A blanket permission of asking anything to the dead people. And then when you study further, we find the same glorious Quran has informed us about Isa a.s. When you read Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayat number 157 and 158, Allah said, They say, they boast that they have killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. They have neither killed him nor did they crucify him. But a similitude was presented before them. Whosoever doubts regarding this matter, they speak only without evidence, out of conjecture. For a surety, they did not kill Isa a.s. Instead, Allah lifted him towards him. And when you read Sunan Abu Dawood, Hadith number 4311, the beloved Prophet spoke about the 10 major signs before Day of Judgment. And one of the major signs he said, 
Isa alayhi salam will come back. Meaning, he didn't die, so he has to come back and he has to die. So he's not dead. Now we ask any Muslim, any Muslim from any Jamaat, if he's with basic education of Islam, ask him, are the Sahaba more in honor and great than the Anbiya and Rasul? So the answer is no. We all know the answer is no. In fact, many people who venerate Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah to a very high grade, even they quote on behalf of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullah when he was asked that you are such a pious Muslim, you are such a righteous Muslim, Ya Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahimahullah, then how do you differentiate between you and the Sahaba? And we all know the popular answer he gave. The difference between me and a Sahabi who saw Muhammad Sassam or lived with Muhammad Sassam for the minimum of time of the lowest grade Sahabi. The difference between me and him is that I cannot compete with the dust that blows from the conveyance on which he is journeying. That Sahabi or the Sahabiya is journeying. That is the difference between me and the Sahabi he said. So, Sheikh Abdul Khadir Jilani Rahmatullah is considered to be the wali of all the walis, meaning the best of all the awliya Allah. He is differentiating himself with the Sahaba and saying there is no competition between us. Then further, the Sahaba compared to Ambiya and Rasul, they cannot be competed. Rasul and Ambiya have been directly chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is sending wahi upon them. We all know that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is directly sending wahi upon his Nabi and Rasul. Of all the messengers, there are five who are ululazm. Of them is Isa alayhi salam. Isa alayhi salam, is he living or is he dead? Every Muslim's iman is, he is alive. If a Muslim says he is dead, he is out of Islam. He cannot say that. He is alive. But have you ever found any Sahabi ascribing Isa alayhi salam as a partner to Allah in any dua? When there is a Rasul who is still living, he is not even dead. Yet, we don't take his name ascribing him as a partner in the duas we make to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then they quote another incident of a blind sahabi. It is in Ibn Majah. There was a blind sahabi. He came to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and he said, Ya Rasulullah, pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I get the eyesight. My eyesight is stored for me, restored for me. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, it is better to remain like that. Allah will enter you in Jannat. If you can be patient, be patient. Otherwise, I will make dua. He said, Ya Rasulullah, no, please make dua. I get my eyesight back. So the Prophet Sallallahu asked him to make wazu, he came back and the Prophet said, now you also make dua and he made dua and he said, Oh Allah, I ask you, I ask you by focusing upon you in the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Be Muhammadin Nabiyir Rahma. In the name of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet of Mercy. And I ask you to restore my sight and I ask you, to accept the dua that Muhammad Sassam made for me. This is what the Nabina Sahabi said. The blind Sahabi. What is he saying? I ask you in the name of Muhammad Sassam. I turn towards you in the name of Muhammad Sassam. Now, the Arabic part there, you see, he took the wasila. There is no word wasila there. He made him the wasila. The Arabic part, it doesn't carry the word wasila. And if I agree for the sake of argument, if I even agree for the sake of argument, then that is the best example that Umar ibn Khattab, Abbas and all the Sahaba must have taken to make dua for rain because the incident of famine in Medina, it happened after Muhammadism died and Umar ibn Khattab was the Khalifa. But none of them still took the wasila of Muhammad Moreover, when you read the entire Quran, there are so many duas that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us. Of them, at least there are 40 duas, 40, 4, 0, 40 duas that begin with Rabbana, O oh our Rabb, who is our Rabb, Alhamdulillahi, Allah Rabbul Alameen, 
اللہ از اور رب سو دا دوازار ربنا آتینا فی الدنیا حسنتا و فی الاخرتی حسنتا و خنازا بننا ربنا ربنا at least 40 دواز in the قرآن that begin with ربنا then there are other دواز not a single دوا has been taught by اللہ سبحانہ وتعالی where اللہ taught us to take the وسیلہ of محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم or anybody else not a single دوا سور فاتحہ is referred as ummud dua the mother of all the duas is there any wasila in that dua in surah fatiha there is no wasila in surah fatiha then there are hundreds of duas taught by none other than muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam recorded in sahih al-bukhari sahih al-muslim abu daud tirmizi an-nasai yazid ibn maja musnad ahmad riyaz salihin al-adab al-mufrad There are so many books of hadith, so many duas taught by Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Show one dua where Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught that you shall ask Allah with a partner ascribing to Him in the duas. Not a single dua. So ascribing partners to Allah in the duas can make you end your Islam for yourself, because. When you are ascribing partner to Allah, you are already saying that I am doing this because they will ask Allah for me, meaning your faith on this person to know about what you are asking, to consider you and have mercy and love upon you, you have placed it more than you should have believed in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what did Allah say in the Quran in Surah Zumar, Surah number 39, ayat number 53? Allah said, Ya Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, say to my slaves, however major or minor sins, whatever number of sins they may have committed, la taqnatu min rahmatillah, do not despair the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is Allah teaching us in the Quran? Whatever you must have done, don't despair my mercy, don't give up, to me being the most merciful. The moment you are appointing a partner in the duas to Allah, you are committing a crime of despairing to the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are alleging that if I ask Allah, Allah will not listen to me. You are alleging that if I ask Allah, Allah will listen late to me. You are alleging that if they ask Allah something for me, Allah can never reject it. You see, it's a serious issue. So it's a major shirk. So this is the second deed that can make our Islam end for us. The third, not considering a mushrik or a kafir as a disbeliever. Mushrik and kafir in the Quran have been very clearly spoken by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be disbelievers. When you read Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, Ayat number 257, Ayat al-Kursi, the ayat after that and then the next ayat. Ayat number 257. Ayat al-Kursi is ayat number 255. Ayat number 257. Allahu waliyu al-lazina amanu yukhri johum minas zulumati ila nur. Allah is the wali of the Muslims. He brings them out from darkness into light. Wal-lazina kafaru and those who are kafir. Wal-lazina kafaru. Awliya'uhumu ta'ghut. They are the wali of taghut, false deities, false gods, fake gods, demigods. Allah is demarcating. Allah is saying what are kafirs? They are the friends of the false deities. Allahu waliyu lazina amanu. If you are a person who says I am a Muslim, I am a believer, Allah is saying then I am your wali. But if you don't take me as your wali, then the people who don't take me as the wali, who is their wali? Their wali is a taghut. Taghut means anything whom you consider worthy to be worshipped or someone who has the power to help you besides Allah is taghut in Arabic. Every Muslim scholar agrees to that definition. There is no difference of opinion in it. Who is taghut? Anything, anyone besides Allah whom you worship or you call upon to fulfill your needs is taghut in Arabic language in the glorious Quran. 
And what is Allah saying? Allahu waliyu lazina amanu. Wal lazina kafaru awliyahu muttaqud. They are the wali of the taqud. And what does the taqud do? Yukhriju nahum mina nuri ila zulumat. The taqud, they will take these people from nur, from light into darkness. What is the light? This is the light. What is the light? The seerat of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is the light. Anything that deviates you from this light and the light of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seerat is darkness. Is the lala. So Allah says they will take you into darkness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will throw them into fire. Ulaika ashabun nar. These people who are the friends of the taghut. Who are they? They are kafir. Allah is saying that. What is their destination? Ulaika, all of them, ashabun nar. They are the sahaba of the nar, of the fire. Ashabun nar. They are the people of the fire. Allahu waliyu lazina amanu yukhrijuhum mina zulumati ila nur. Wal lazina kafaru awliya uhumu taghut. Yukhrijunahum mina nuri ila zulumat. Ulaika ashabun nar. Hum fiha khalidun. They will remain there forever and ever. In Arabic, when the word Khalidun is used, it means forever and ever. So Allah is saying the disbelievers, they will remain there forever and ever. Allah says in Surah Tawbah, Surah number 9, in Surah Fatah, Surah number 48, Ayat number 28, in Surah Saf, Surah number 61, Ayat number 9, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ رَسُولَهُ بِالْهُدَى وَالدِّينِ الْحَقْلِ يُذِهِرُهُ عَلَى الدِّينِ كُلِّ وَلَوْ كَرِيهَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ Allah is saying, Mushrik are the people who dislike that Islam shall prevail. Do you dislike that Islam shall prevail as a Muslim? No. So if somebody is disliking that, Allah is saying they are Mushrik. Surah Kafirun, Allah is saying, that, you know, in our society we have some Alex smart Muslims who say, no, 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 do not call the Kafir a Kafir. Why? He can become Muslim, she can become Muslim someday. Oh really? So then we shall not call you a Muslim. Because what is the guarantee? Before you die, you can become a Mushrik or a Kafir. Then you are also not a Muslim in that. If that logic is to be applied, that someday they will become a Muslim, so don't call them Kafir. So someday you can become a Kafir, you shall not be called a Muslim, no? Is that any logic? No. We are calling them what they are today. If they become a Muslim, we will call them Muslim on that day. So it's not a big issue. And you know, our Prophet did not like that we shall call them kafir. They are supporting the allegation of some enemies of Islam who are saying that kafir is an abusive term. Whereas we are trying to explain to them kafir merely means one who disbelieved in the message of Islam. It merely means that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed a surah and is asking us, the problem is because we Indian subcontinent Muslims, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Myanmar, Nepal, Indonesia, Malaysia, we don't know Arabic as our mother tongue. So, when we read in Arabic, we don't know what exactly we are reading. But the Arabs know what they are reading. And what is Allah saying in Surah Kafirun, Surah number 109, Ayat number 1 to 6, Allah says, Qul se. Say, so if I am being said, commanded to say, I need somebody to say something. Who is that somebody Allah is asking me to say in Surah Kafirun? Allah says, Khul, Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. The same, Ya Ayyuhal Muslimun, Ya Ayyuhal Ladina Amanu, O you who believe. Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun, Allah is saying, say to them, say to them by calling them what? O you Kafir. O oh, you kafirun, O oh, you disbelievers in Islam, La abudu mata abudun. I do not worship what you worship. Wala antum abiduna ma abud. And you don't worship whom I worship. Wala ana abidum ma abadtum. I am absolutely not going to worship what you are worshipping. Wala antum abiduna ma abud. And it does not appear to me that you will worship whom I am worshipping. Whom am I worshipping as a Muslim? Allah. Whom are they worshipping? They are worshipping anything besides Allah. Allah is asking me, tell them, O oh, disbelievers, I will not worship what you worship. You will not worship what I worship. I am not going to worship what you are worshipping. I don't find you to be worshipping what I am going to worshipping. 
worship lakum dinukum wal yadin your deen is to you my deen is to me and they are saying don't call them kafir don't call them mushrik a kafir is a kafir a mushrik is a mushrik a muslim is a muslim that's what i started my talk with they can be a hindu a non hindu a christian a non christian an indian a non indian a muslim non muslim arabic word for non muslim is kafir and non muslim can be of two types there can be an atheist who doesn't believe in any god at all any religion at all and there can be somebody who believes in a religion and a god but they do not believe in islam to be that religion and allah to be that god those who do not believe in any religion and any god are kafir those who believe in a god and religion other than allah and islam are mushrik as simple as that so not calling them kafir and mushrik what are you going to call them are you trying to be better in human relationship than the mercy to entire universe arsalna ka rehmat al lil alamin mumassam was rehmat of alamin he was the best and he never shied off to call a kafir a kafir a mushrik a mushrik a muslim a muslim and as a muslim why will i feel abused if somebody says you are a non christian yes i am a non christian why will i shy off if somebody says you are a non pakistani yes i am a non pakistani so based on this islam and it says non muslim the arabic terminologies used are kafir and mushrik kafir meaning one who doesn't believe in any god and any religion mushrik meaning one who doesn't worship allah subhanahu wa taala and worship somebody else besides allah subhanahu wa taala so this is how islam has been clear if you do not believe them call a kafir a kafir and a mushrik and mushrik you shy off to do that even that deed is enough to make you go out of the fold of islam to end your islam then the fourth one to take someone else other than muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as a better example for you to obey and to follow as a muslim allah made it clear in surah ahzab surah number 33 ayat number 21 allah said laqad kana lakum fi rasulillahi uswatun hasana the best example for mankind is in the uswa is in the life of muhammad rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in the same surah surah number 33 allah subhanahu wa taala made it very clear that muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in ayat number 46 allah said he invites you towards allah with the permission of allah meaning as mentioned in surah najm also surah number 53 ayat number 3 and 4 my messenger does not speak anything except what i command to him then surah khalam surah number 68 that my messenger is on the zenith of morals and etiquettes of characters he is the best of all of you in his characters morals and ethics so allah subhanahu wa taala is making it very clear that the best person for us to follow is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam for us to obey is muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam if you consider someone else other than muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam on any ground that is enough to end your islam and many times we don't utter it from our words but in our thoughts and our actions we reflect that there are some things that i think i should follow him instead of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam nauzubillah may allah forbid and that is so dangerous can you imagine we had on the facebook videos of people imitating non muslim film actors in so many things to the extent that they are not realizing that they are doing something so severely against the very fundamentals of islam for example we had the halloween festival how many muslims participated in that unfortunately there were videos out of saudi arabia we have no precedence earlier to that so this is such an unfortunate thing you took somebody else you want to enjoy the prophet sallam taught us the ways to enjoy in life but you took somebody else to be a better example for you to enjoy for holidaying so all these things are something very serious if you are considering someone better than muhammad sallam to obey or to follow as an example in your life how will i decide it the choice of my profession decides it 
What profession have I chosen for myself? I am a Muslim. I have chosen film acting. I have chosen to become an actor, an actress. It decided that I have chosen someone else as a better person to guide me. As a person better whom I shall follow than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And this is something very serious. So this can end your Islam. Then the next one is disliking any teaching or any practice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You understood? First one, shirk and kufr. Second one, ascribing partners to Allah in our duas, in our supplications. Third, not considering mushrik and a kafir as a disbeliever. Fourth, taking someone else better to follow and obey than Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Fifth, disliking any teaching or any practice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa For example, if the Prophet sallallahu said, as narrated in Sayyid al-Bukhari volume number 7, Hadith number 5892-5893 that you shall grow your beard. Somebody is shaving the beard. He doesn't want to grow the beard. And A, B, C, D, W, X, Y, Z excuses they are giving. Of no use. You have already in your practice proven that you are disliking the command of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa If the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is saying wear hijab, you cannot intermingle without hijab with your even first cousins daughters of your aunt brothers of your aunt sons of your uncle sons of your aunt you can't intermingle with them daughters of your uncle daughters of your aunt you can't intermingle with them without hijab and you want to oh, hey, this is too much I take them only to be my sisters what is this this is too much so what did you dislike you disliked what Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam taught and practiced and what is Allah saying about Muhammad Sallallahu Allah says Surah Nisa Surah number 4 Ayat number 80 Whoever obeys Muhammad Sallallahu Obeys me Obeying Muhammad Sallallahu Allah says he is obeying me Because my messenger Gives you command only because I commanded him to give you the commands Allah says in Ali Imran Surah number 3 Ayat number 32 In Ali Imran Surah number 3 Ayat number 132 Surah Nisa Surah number 4 Ayat number 59 Surah Maida Surah number 5 Ayat number 92 Surah Anfal Surah number 8 Ayat number 1 Surah Anfal Surah number 8 Ayat number 20 Surah Anfal Surah number 8 Ayat number 46 Surah Nur Surah number 24 Ayat number 52 Surah Nur Surah number 24 Ayat number 54 Surah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Surah number 47 Ayat number 33 Surah Mujadila Surah number 58 Ayat number 13 Surah Taghabun Surah number 64 Ayat number 12 Atiullah wa Atiur Rasul Obey Allah and Obey Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Allah said in Surah Nisa, Surah number 4, Ayat number 65. Allah said, by your Lord. Can you imagine? Allah is swearing. Allah doesn't need to swear. Whatever Allah said is truth. But Allah is swearing. By your Lord, O Muhammad Sallallahu They can never be true Muslims. Unless they do not make you the judge in all the affairs of their life. And if you decide anything for them. If you pass a judgment on any issue for them, if they don't accept it with happiness, with fullest heart, for a surety they are not true Muslims. Can you imagine ayat of the Quran? And we are disliking and disobeying. Allah is saying they can't be true Muslims. If they don't accept your judgment, not just accepting condition of accepting, with fullest conviction. You shall have that conviction. Yes, this is what Muhammad said. This is the best for me. There cannot be anything better than this. Unless they don't do that, they cannot be true Muslims. Surah Ahzab, Surah number 33, Ayat number 36. It does not befit a Muslim man. It does not befit a Muslim woman. It does not befit a Muslim boy. It does not befit a Muslim girl. To decide anything after Allah and Muhammad Sassam have decided something for them. To make a choice other than what Allah and Muhammad Sassam has decided for them. Allah says in Surah Ahzab, Surah number 33, Ayat number 71. وَمَنْ يُتِهِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ Whosoever obeys Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam فَخَدْ فَازَ فَوْزَ نَزِيمًا they are the ones who have actually become successful. They are the truly victorious ones. Disliking 
سورہ محمد صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم سورہ نمبر 47 آیت نمبر 9 8 and 9 اللہ رب العالمین destroyed all their good deeds only because they disliked کریہا in Arabic کریہا means کراہت disliking only because they disliked what Allah has revealed Allah revealed something and you disliked Allah said I have destroyed all your good deeds and no rewards for you I have wasted them for you they have become void they have become zero of no use why you disliked something what Allah revealed ayat number 26 to 29 of the same surah again surah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam what is Allah saying they said to the disbelievers they said to the disbelievers we agree with you for certain things we agree that in this time this is not possible we agree with you and this disliked of what Allah revealed a portion of what Allah revealed and they said to the disbelievers we are with you in some things we agree with you in certain things and they disliked what Allah revealed they were displeased with what Allah was pleased and they were pleased with what Allah was displeased so when the death approaches any one of them of such an attitude of such a behavior of such a person who calling himself or herself a Muslim they disliked something what Allah revealed in the Quran Allah is saying on that behalf on that condition when death approaches any one of them any Muslim man or Muslim woman who did this when death approaches them my angels of death they will smite their faces and their backs mar mar ke ruh ko nikalenge and pull their souls and say to them how dare you disliked what Allah was pleased with and how dare you liked something with what Allah was displeased with Allah hated something and you liked it and Allah liked something and you hated it how dare you did that so Allah says wait till your death if someone of you is doing this so disliking this can end your Islam you see Islam is ended already by the time your soul is being pulled now that is the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned in Ali Imran surah number 3 ayat number 1 not 2 Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu taqullah haqqa tukatehi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimu O you who believe fear Allah as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shall be feared and do not die except that at the time of death you remain a Muslim Allahu Akbar then what is the next one shirk and kufr ascribing partners to Allah in supplications in duas not considering mushrik and kafir a disbeliever considering someone else as a better example to follow and obey than Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam disliking what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has brought to us from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala or what Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam practiced then the sixth one if you make fun or pass a joke on any subject that is related to you, of course no Muslim will make a joke of Allah make a joke of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam things related to if you pass a joke only for the sake of fun you had no intention Nauz Billah to ridicule Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to mock Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala or the teachings of Islam or Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the teachings of Quran you did it only for the sake of fun that is enough to end your Islam what happened in Surah Tawbah Surah number 9 Ayat number 65 and 66 Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they when you ask them why did you do this they say our intention was only to make some joke the context I will explain to you the ayat says when you ask them why did you say this they say we said this our intention was only playful it was out of fun it was only a joke we didn't mean it you know what is Allah saying to them Ayat number 66 say to them, O Muhammad Sallallahu they became kafir after having Iman. Allahu Akbar. Who is giving this statement? This judgment? Allah is giving the judgment. About whom? About those people who made fun or a statement of joke. And Allah is saying in ayat number 65, when they said, we did it only for the sake of fun, ask them, O Muhammad Sallallahu did they not find anything besides the ayat of Allah, the signs of Allah to make joke of? 
सो मेकिंग जोक्स ऑन जन्नत ऑन जहन्नम ऑन द डे ऑफ जजमेंट अबाउट एंजल्स अबाउट द इवेंट्स दैट आर टू हैपन ऑन डे ऑफ जजमेंट अबाउट द प्रॉफिट ऑफ अल्लाह अबाउट एनीथिंग इफ यू आर डूइंग इट ओनली फॉर द सेक ऑफ फन ऑल्सो अल्लाह से दे बिकेम काफेर आफ्टर दे हैड ईमन सो दिस इज another condition the sixth condition that can push you out of islam that can end your islam for you then the seventh is sorcery witchcraft magic of certain kinds not of all kinds but of certain kinds surah bakra surah number 2 ayat number 102 allah is saying in the quran they learned of spells in the kingdom of solomon and solomon did not teach them and we sent angels harut and marut and they learned they used to go to harut and marut those angels and they used to tell them to teach them magic to teach them sorcery and witchcraft and the angels will would tell them that do not learn from us we have been sent an exam, as an exam to you from allah subhanahu wa taala don't learn from us yet even after the angels warning them they used to learn from the angels sorcery witchcraft to make disputes between husbands and wives and they were ignorant they took the help of the shaitan they learned it from the shaitan and they went astray surah anam surah number 6 ayat number 128 to ayat number 130 allah said on the day of judgment allah will say oh you group of jinn and oh you group of men we all know shaitan is from the jinns all of you know this or not surah kahf surah number 18 ayat number 50 Allah said iblis is from the jinn meaning a category the evil category of the jinn are called shaitan shaitan is not the name shaitan is an attribute it is from shatana shatana means from shaitan means someone who turn into another direction so aggressively that he will never turn back again so aggressively he turned away from allah subhanahu wa taala in disobedience to allah rebelled against allah subhanahu wa taala now billah never to obey again allah subhanahu wa taala so shaitan is from the jinnat and ayat number 128 to 130 of surah anam allah says on day of judgment i shall ask o oh, you group of jinn o oh, you group of men you used to help each other in the face of the earth sorcery you used to help each other on the face of the earth and today both of you will be thrown into hell fire both of you your destination is hell fire for ever so certain types of magic in islam is unforgivable it can end your islam for you then eighth helping non muslims over muslims helping non muslims over muslims when you read the glorious quran allah said in surah nisa surah number 4 ayat number 139 those people who take the disbelievers as their friends over the friendship of the muslim believers they do it only so that they receive some honor from them so that the non muslims appreciate oh so good muslims they are secular muslims and i don't need to individually point out we know how many of them are there in the market today only to gain some honor from the non muslims allah is saying those who took non muslims as friends over the muslims only to get some honor from them don't they know don't they know that all honor is only from allah you think they will give you honor they will never give you honor all honor is from allah You know ayat number 144 of surah nisa is so strong command of allah surah nisa ayat number 144 what is the ayat o oh, you muslims o oh, you who believe do not take as your friends do not take as your friends the disbelievers and do not establish a clear proof against yourself with allah subhanahu wa taala allah akbar allah is saying if you take Oh Muslims I am commanding you don't take the disbelievers as your friends over the Muslims and don't establish an evident proof against yourself with Allah subhanahu wa taala now what kind of non muslims does it mean every non muslim does it mean that if there is a muslim who is a rapist who is a murderer 
who is a terrorist yet i shall appreciate him and befriend him more than a non muslim who is a good non muslim who is a doctor who does human services no no allah made it very clear defined what kind of non muslims it's not generic when you read surah mumtahina surah number 16 ayat number 8 and ayat number 9 allah said in surah mumtahina allah does not forbid you does not prevent you does not stop you from being kind and just with those non muslims who do not fight with you for your religion and they do not drive you out of your homes for your religion those non muslims who do not fight with you who do not oppose you for your religion do not kick you out of your homes and your cities and your towns with such non muslims allah does not forbid you to be kind to them to be just with them allah only forbids you to befriend them who do not like you and fight you only because you believe in allah it is about these non muslims so allah says such kind of non muslims do not take them as your friends over the believers amongst the believers you have hypocrites also you have unrighteous believers also it does not mean unrighteous believers it means good muslims over good muslims do not take these non muslims who do not like you for your religion and surah muntahina ayat number 1 and 2 begins with something very important allah says oh you who believe do not take the do not take my enemies and your enemies now here it is generic rule it is not about disbelievers alone do not take my enemies and your enemies my enemies allah's enemies enemies of allah and your enemies as your friends over the believers do not take them don't you see they have rejected the truth that you believe in your enemies they rejected the truth that you believe in and they want to drive out the messenger and the people who believe out of their homes don't take them as friends ayat number 2 surah mumtahina allah says if ever they get dominance over you if ever they overpower you what will they do with you they will not hesitate to stop their hands and their tongue against you only because you believe in allah they will not hesitate so these kind of enemies of allah these kind of non muslims allah says do not befriend them in comparison to good muslims so if you do that you are ending your islam for yourself you know why allah says whoever be friends them against the muslims be friends whom those non muslims who are enemies of islam and the muslims if you be friend them then you are one of them allahu akbar then you are one of them allahu akbar so it is very clear again then the ninth one to end your islam considering someone exempted from following certain commands of allah so amongst the muslim community ignorant muslims they consider some people who are insane who are mentally retarded to be the friends of allah and they say these people have become so close to allah near to allah that they don't require to perform five times salah they don't require to fast to the extent that there was some person long back at the time of aurangzeb it is said that he used to say an al haq i am al haq and we all know al haq is only allah subhanahu wa taala but he said i am an al haq i am al haq why because i love allah so much that no allah is in me and i am in allah nauz billah so no exemptions now no salah is required and all this allah says to muhammad sallam surah number 39 ayat number 13 in surah zumar say to them i have been commanded what have i been commanded i have been commanded that if i disobey allah i fear a punishment of a tremendous day allah says in surah maida surah number 5 ayat number 44 yahkum bima anzal allah whoever does not judge does not obey what has been 
given as a command to them faulai ka humul kafirun for a surety they are kafir ayat number 44 ayat number 45 yahkum bima anzal allah whoever does not take this as a judgment for them this command to obey faulai ka humul zalimun they are zalim ayat number 47 surah maida surah number 5 faulai ka humul fasikhun they are perverted transgressors surah maida surah number 5 ayat number 49 then take this as the hukum bainahum to judge between them and do not obey them ahwaahum in their vain desires for if you obey them then they may slip you away from any of the teachings of the quran that allah has revealed to you you know what is allah saying don't obey anyone besides allah subhanahu wa taala if you obey them there are high chances they will make you slip away not from entire quran allah says from some of the teachings of the quran and nobody will be able to help you on day of judgment against allah then allah akbar so nobody is exempted from sharia when muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is being said that say to them if i disobey i fear a punishment of the tremendous day who is left now who is who is any tom dick and harry abdullah abdur rahman and abdur rauf after that no way then so nobody is exempted from sharia if somebody thinks that way that is the end of their islam after that and finally the 10th one those who do not consider the learning of a deen religion more important than any other thing in the world for them allah said in surah anam surah number 6 ayat number 70 Surah Anam, Surah number six, Ayat number one thirty. Surah Araf, Surah number seven, Ayat number fifty one to fifty three. In Surah Hadid, Surah number fifty seven, Ayat number twenty. What did Allah say? Allah said, "This life is nothing except play and amusement. This life is nothing except play and amusement, and it is delusion for you. What is a delusion? You see, when it's hot sun." and you find on the road it looks like water it's a mirage but when you go there there is no water the arabic word dunya rabbana atana fid dunya you know dunya is from dana the root is dana for dunya and basically it has two meanings dana is from adna adna lowest cheapest something which is cheapest of no value at all the cheapest ah it's so cheap it has no value cheapest and the other meaning of dana is from which is dunya is dana is something that it can you can touch it with your hand but you can never grip it you may touch it but you can never grip it mercury if you can try to grip it you see it slips but you can touch it so dunya you can feel the enjoyment but you can never take it forever it's a delusion so if somebody doesn't give importance to learning islam because that was the first wahi to muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam it was not merely ikra as has been misinterpreted and misquoted all the places by secular muslims pseudo secular muslims allah said in islam read education what education allah didn't just say ikra he said ikra bi ismi rabbikal ladhi khalaq read acquire education in the name of your lord who created you based on this criteria acquire every other education if minus this then your education that you are acquiring for this world to gain this world is useless you know why surah hadid surah number 57 ayat number 20 is a very powerful ayat and this duniya the life of this world is nothing except play and amusement and zinat adornment brands you want zinat adornment and except a competition over each other of boasting over each other with fakhr boasting over each other and in competing with each other and who is more wealthy and who has more children this is nothing more than that kullu nafsin zaiqatul maut every living thing will taste death surah al imran surah number 3 ayat number 
185. Everything will taste death. And you will know on day of judgment what you have been doing, what you earn. And this life is nothing except mata al ghurur. Meaning ghurur. You see, ghurur, are bhot ghurur kar rahe ne. What does ghurur mean? Ghurur means to think about yourself of something which you actually are not. So this world is nothing except ghurur. You are dying so much for it, whereas it is nothing. Surah number 102, ayat number 128. Their greed to acquire wealth has made their life reach towards their grave, till their grave. They are so greedy that they have already reached the grave, yet they want more and more. So this life, you did everything to earn this life. Forgot the religion. Surah Hashar, Surah number 59, Ayat number 19. Those who forget the remembrance of Allah, Allah will make them forget themselves. Allah Akbar. What does Allah mean? What does it mean? Allah will make you forget yourselves. It means you will get engrossed, involved in things which are of no use to you on day of judgment. And you will feel very happy doing that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from all this. I would like to end my talk by reading the popular share of Allah Iqbal which I have customized a bit. Allah se kare dur to talim bhi fitna. If you are acquiring an education that is deviating you, taking you away far from the remembrance of Allah, then that education is surely a great trial for you. Allah se kare dur to talim bhi fitna. Ma baap bhi aulad bhi jagir bhi fitna. If you have parents whose love and affection or whose obedience takes you away from obeying Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa makes you a disobedient Muslim to Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa then those parents are a big trial for you. Allah se kare du to talim bhi fitna ma baap bhi aulad bhi jagir bhi fitna if you have children in whose love and affection you have started to earn haram disobey Allah and Muhammad Sassam, then those children are a trial for you if you are striving to acquire wealth and you do not strive to acquire only halal permitted by Allah then that wealth is a fitna for you however rich you may be on the Forbes magazine, maybe for 50 years you are number one. Allah se kare dur, taaleem bhi fitna, maabab bhi, aulad bhi, jagir bhi fitna. Na haq ke liye uthe, to talwar bhi fitna. If you have risen a weapon, if you have raised a weapon, a gun, or a sword, and if you have done it, to fight for falsehood, then even that sword, it's a trial for you. That weapon, that power that you got is a trial for you. If you are misusing your power. Na haq ke liye uthe, to talwar bhi fitna. Talwar hi kya? Naare takbir bhi fitna. And if you are giving naare takbir, Allahu Akbar, even if you are taking the name of Allah and pronouncing the name of Allah to be, Allah to be the greatest, but by pronouncing that slogan, you are doing things which are against Allah and Muhammad Sallallahu that even that Allahu Akbar is a big trial for you. وآخر الدعوان الحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I request all of you to kindly contribute your donations to IREF We are still falling short of our required budget We required almost 10 lakh rupees But we are still falling short by 5 lakh 40 thousand rupees I would be very grateful to you if you people can contribute for us جزاك الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Amen